You know, every team plans to go out and win the Super Bowl every year, but apparently only two make it there. Everybody else just hopes to make it there. But honestly, everyone makes plans that fail. We all do. It's not something some of us do. We've all made plans that fail. In Acts 27, there was a captain that made a plan, apparently, to try to run the ship that was in that storm to the seashore. Didn't make it, got stuck on some reefs, and the ship broke apart. Paul planned to visit Rome, and, uh, but he didn't really plan to go there the way he did. And when he planned to go, according to Romans 1, he didn't make it there. Paul also planned to visit Corinth. And when he planned to visit Corinth, he didn't know all the things that were going to come up that did. And then he changed his mind, decided not to go right then. We all make plans that fail. We think we're going to be able to do it, and we're not able to do it. So at this moment, you should not be shocked that I can announce now for certain the Buccaneers will not be in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Just letting you know. There were three guys from Brandon that died. Slim, Billy Bob, and Bubba. They went to the pearly gates. And they were supposed to be St. Peter there, but they had to get meet a substitute angel. Apparently it was late in the day when they passed away, and St. Peter had already turned in for the evening. So the substitute angel said, well, I'm here just to let you know that Peter has already retired for the night, but uh, he asked Albert Einstein to take his place. And he's going to show you around, give you something to do, talk to you, until the morning when Peter gets up. Is that okay? And they were like, yeah, sure. So he, uh, Albert Einstein turns to Slim and he says, by the way, Slim, after he introduced who he is, he says, by the way, Slim, what was your IQ when you were alive? And he says it was 160. He said, great. He says, we'll discuss my general relativity theory and maybe we'll even discuss some unified field theory. How does that sound to you? He says, that's an exciting opportunity. Absolutely, great. So then he turns and introduces himself to Billy Bob. And he says, uh, tell me, Billy Bob, uh, what uh, was your IQ when you were alive on earth? He says, I was 140. He says, that's good. He says, if you'd like, we can discuss uh, philosophy, maybe even some rocket science as we look at at some of the stars and things like that. How's that sound? Nothing I'd like better than that. And then he turns to Bubba and he says, uh, what about your IQ? What were you when you were alive? He says, I'm not sure, but I think I was about 60. He punched him in the arm and said, hey Bubba, how about them buccaneers? <laughs> we plan to go to the Super Bowl. Plans do not always succeed. You think about it, you want it to happen, and they just don't happen in football as in life and as in church life. Though you do need a plan. You need a game plan. You're not... I, a lot of you ladies that really don't know football, let me, let me inform you of something that a lot of you may not know. Football is complicated. I, it may look like just a bunch of guys get out on the field running at each other. It's a very complex game. And if you get to the pro level you got to be smart just to play. Because it's a complicated game. Very complicated game. There are five parts of an effective football game plan. Now it's just, you not played a game yet. This is what they do. They first diagram, diagram all their opponents' plays. All of them. These little X's and O's, those actually mean something. And then they track all their norms. What they do on first down on the 20 yard line normally, second down on the 20 yard line normally, third down on the 20, not 20 yard line, the 30 yard line, 40 yard line, 50 yard line, 60 yard line, set, oh wait, doesn't go like that. <laughs> but they track them all the way down. They know exactly what they do in the red zone, if you know what that is. They know what they do on any given play. They have to calculated it out, but then more. 
they focus on their athletes. What are the real key athletes on that other team? What can they do? What have they been observed doing before? And how do you counter them? Do you, if he's really strong, how do you tackle a really big uh, Derrick Henry? How do you do that? How, how do you do it? How do you check? What do you do to stop people like that? And you, you look at all that. And then you note their situational norms, what they do in a given situation when they get backed up or in situations like that. And then after you've done all of that, those four things, then what you do on the fifth thing is, is you sit down and adjust all of your play patterns to counter theirs. You move a guy from, believe it or not, this right here can stop a play. Believe it or not, that much of a movement at the right place can stop the other team from getting first down. If you know what their play is, you've got it. If your men have really studied it, they're aware. So it's actually quite complicated game plans. There are three qualities of an effective way of planning. A lot of people don't recognize this about life. If you want to plan for life, it's complicated. But there are some things you could do. Now, this is not a part of the, you're getting this for free. This is not a part of your outline if you're looking at your outline right now. But one thing is you, you need some wise, some deft guidance. If the Bible says specifically that there is plans succeed in wise counsel. So if you want to get something done, if you're thinking it up all by your little self, it's not as likely to succeed as if you talk to somebody else about it. That's just good advice. I know you're brilliant, but talk to somebody else too. Amen? You're more likely to succeed. And then divine providence. You can't outrule that, right? Because men make plans, but God make plans succeed. So you want God to be on your side. So in that, you want a little prayer probably. And then there's due diligence. You can have all the plans in the world, but you actually have to work hard to make them happen. You can go to all the meetings of a football team and still not be able to pull off your play because you never practiced. It takes hard work. So there's things like that in your personal life. You can have all these wonderful plans about how you're gonna be a millionaire by the time you're 40, but if you're 50, it hasn't worked out Maybe because you didn't work at it like you should have worked the plan. Or maybe it's a bad plan. But some confuse a game plan with other important things. See, a game plan is not who we are. Buccaneers is a name. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not pushing Buccaneers this morning. I'm just using that as an example. But that's just a name. That's not a game plan. That's who we are, maybe. A game plan is not what we believe. Players believe all kinds of things. A church, that's not our game plan, just what we believe. It's essential as a part of it, but it's not a game plan. A game plan is what we plan to do to win. That's a game plan. So a successful team plans and how they're going to win. How could we possibly win that game? And we have game plans to succeed, and we succeed, but we succeed for something else too. I'm talking about game plan this morning, but there's something else. There's another part of this equation, and that's called us. You see, it's a team, and there's got to be a passion for us to win. And if you're not a part of us to win, it doesn't matter what the game plan is. You got to be a part of us to make it win. Halftime, 1928 Army versus Notre Dame game. Notre Dame is not doing well, and you may not like Notre Dame. I don't particularly care for them that much myself. They've beaten Alabama at critical moments, so. Uh, but they are having one of their worst seasons, and Newt Rockney told them of the tragic death of a former player, you wouldn't know him. His name was George Gipp. Apparently he was great at the time. He'd gotten pneumonia a couple of years before and had died unexpectedly. They made a movie about that. 1940 made the movie about Newt Rockney, All-American. And there's a little actor in there. Do y'all see him up there? Y'all see that guy? He's a B actor, always was. 
even after he became president, he was a man. But Ronald, Ronald Reagan, uh, but he played George Gipp. Here's the scene from that. Well, boys, I haven't a thing to say. Uh, this, this is what happened. Play again. This is what he preached and, and then what happened in the script there. Well, boys, I haven't a thing to say. Play a great game. All of you, great game. I guess we just can't expect to win them all. I'm going to tell you something I've kept to myself for years. None of you ever knew uh, George Gipp. It was long before your time, but you know what a tradition he is at Notre Dame. And the last thing he said to me, Newt, uh, Rockney, he said, sometimes when the team, and this is the part of the scene right here, this is what happened in the scene. Sometime when the team is up against it and the brakes are beating the boys, tell them to go out there with all they've got and win just one for the Gipper. I don't know where I'll be then, Rock, he said, but I'll know it and I'll be happy. Now, supposedly that's a true story. Um, there was a hush silence fell over the uh, crowd of boys in the locker room and then somebody shouted out, well, let's go. And they went out and they won that game even though they were a terrible team and they were behind at that point, 12 to six. There's a passion. So we can have all the techniques, but there has to be a passion and that passion has to be for us. Um, I want you to be successful in life for your whole family. Right? Not just you. Love you. But it isn't just about you. We love you, right? Whoever you are. We love you. But it isn't just about you. It's about us. We win for us. We win for the team. This is not just about you. You may think your life is just about you. But it's about us. You are about us. We are about you. That passion is what makes a game plan work. And without that, and without understanding of that, that we win one for the Gipper. That's the other guy. We don't just win it for us. We win it for the other guy. We want to have a great church. Great. Not for me, for you. For my grandkids, for my great-grandkids, for the church of the future, for others, for us, for the whole world. We do it for others, not just me. Here's, I want to look at three parts of the church's game plan quickly. Number one, there are five salvation deeds that are in our church's game plan. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, if you, there's not one particular verse that nails out all of these things, but all of them are clearly taught all through the New Testament of things that God expects us to do to respond to his gospel invitation. One of those is to hear. So let us hear the word. And the word comes to us from two sources. In, in Psalm, I mean Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4 is repeated in Romans chapter 10. And that is that the first word is, comes to us from the heavens, the creation. But the, the word that converts us to Christ, and that's critical, but the word that comes to us is the word about Christ in Romans chapter 10. And so we must confess Christ. And that leads to the next thing. Uh, let us believe. You have to believe because in Acts chapter 2, when they were taught the gospel, it says those that gladly received. You've got to believe it. Otherwise, your heart won't be pricked. You won't make a change. And you've got to believe it is, as in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, you've got to believe it is the word of God. If you believe, if you will hear it, and then after having looked at this book and the things that you read from it, if you are convinced, you're not convinced by science. You're convinced by the content. It is the content of this book that convinces you. And then you are convinced that it is the word of God. And then you believe it. And then let us all repent. It's essential that we give our heart to change. Now that's not that we have to change our life before we become a Christian. No, we must change our heart. Our life will change after that. 
we determined to change at that point. And we turned from, as in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9, our idols, the things that we loved the most that weren't worth anything at the time. And we turned from darkness, according to Acts 26 and verse 18. So there are things that are just bad that we used to do. Some things weren't bad, it was just we were crazy about something and we spent all of our time in it and we need to let that go. Or maybe it became bad because we became dominated by it. And then let us confess Christ. You know, confession leads to salvation according to Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. So if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, it says. And confessing him before witnesses is essential because Matthew 10, 32 says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So in, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, it says that we make those confessions, those professions before many witnesses, it says. So the more that see it, the better. So apparently it isn't just the confession we do when we obey the gospel, but all of our life. We need to be confessing that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then let us be baptized. I know it's made fun of on a lot of different scales. I get that. I understand. And no, we don't believe that water in and of itself can save anybody. I don't think anybody believes that. And no, we don't believe that some great act of a human being can make him worthy of going to heaven. No, nobody believes that. Do I believe in water regeneration? No, I don't believe in water regeneration. But I do believe you're regenerated in faith when you do what God asks you to do. And he's asked us to be baptized. And according to John 3, 23, that takes much water. So it's not just sprinkling apparently. And it's a righteous act according to Matthew chapter 3, and verse 15, when Jesus said it it's right for us to fulfill all righteousness. So it is a good thing to do if God's asked you to do it. And it indicates that you've truly repented and that you want to receive remission of sins because that's what it was for according to Acts 2 and verse 38. So five salvation deeds are in our church's game plan. But we do them not just for me. We do them for us. This thing can't change from one person to the next. Let me, the gospel's not just for you, it's for everybody. And therefore we, the whole planet, should do those five things. Not some of the planet, not some church folks do these five things. We're all supposed to do the same things as we approach Jesus for salvation. Then secondly, there's five worship deeds that are in our churches game plan. In Acts chapter 2, now this just about mentions all five. Acts 2 and verse 42, on the day of Pentecost it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine, that's one, and in fellowship that's two, and in the breaking of bread, or literally in the Greek, the breaking of the bread, and in prayers. So the breaking of the bread, most scholars believe that refers to literally the communion, or at least the bread that was offered there. So let's commune. We, we had communion a while ago. It was the first worship part of our worship in the New Testament church that was directly directed by Jesus Christ. It's the first thing. In fact, can you name another one? He directly said, do that. But he says, do that in remembrance of me. So, I mean, it's spelled out. And he is better than me, right? So should I do that? And then let us sing. Now, it foretells in Hebrews 2 and verse 12 from the Old Testament prophecy that the only thing it says that Jesus would be in the assembly with his brethren and would do with us is to sing. It says in the midst of the church, I will sing praises. So Jesus joins us when we're singing. Maybe you don't. <laughs> you might choose not to sing, but he chooses to sing with us when we sing. So let us sing. And because we is better than me. Well, so singing teaches us that, doesn't it? Or unless you want to sing a solo. This morning, maybe? No. There might be one or two here that could do that, but most of us are like, I, I don't think so. I'll pass on that. We is better than me. And then let us pray and declare what should be declared by every prayer, and that is that my house shall be called a house of prayer, right? So Jesus always felt like that's what we were supposed to be about. And what's prayer really about? Prayer is about putting 
people first. That's what that's about. Prayer's not about what honoring God, even though it does do that. It's about meeting the needs of people around you, putting people first. A church must do that, my friend. Otherwise, it doesn't have much of a game plan. And let us give. Now, Christ sat where he could watch the giving, we're told in Matthew, I mean Mark chapter 12. And he watched what people were putting in. And then he tells us in Matthew 25, he talks about all the different circumstances of people's lives. They could be in prison or they could be naked or they could be hungry. And did you step in? Here's the deal. We, together, all of us make a difference. We're supposed to make a difference in our world. There's supposed to be fewer hungry people around our building. There should be fewer naked people around wherever you see us gathered, right? We make a difference. And so let us give and let us study. You know, it was always Christ's custom, according to Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, when even when he was a little boy, he went into the synagogue and he stood up to read. He wanted to be a part of the study of the Word. Isn't that interesting? He wanted to be a part of it. Now, I don't know if you want to be a part of the study of the Word, and maybe you don't want to stay for our Bible classes later, but I believe that if Jesus were here Himself today in physical form, I believe He'd stay for Sunday school. I could be wrong about that, but I believe He'd go to a Bible class because I think I see in Him a desire to study the Word. See, we dare to see things as they are. That's why we study the Bible. It's not because I want to read something into it. I want to get what's in there out. Amen? I want to read what's in there. So five deeds are in our church's game plan. And we do it. Why do we do it? We do it for us. You see, this is a simple form of worship. You say, well, well it's not fancy enough for me. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But you know what makes it so wonderful? Is you can do this in any poor country of the world exactly like we did it. You don't have to have a $5,000 piece of equipment to accomplish this. You don't have to have anything, an orchestra to do this. This you saw us do and we're doing can be done on enough to buy a cracker and some grape juice. And most churches can take up a collection, can get that done. And that's what, it's about us. You see, when it, you understand it like that, it's about all of us. It, and when you get that passion, then you see it's for the whole world. And it can work everywhere. Finally, our game plan is five ministry deeds. And that's what we're about. In Ephesians 4 verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, they, you got to understand that a lot of those overlap. Paul was like all of those five things, right? He wrote that, but he's like everything on that list, isn't he? Just about. I mean, maybe he wasn't a pastor because he wasn't married. But I mean, all of that. But let's become apostles. Now, I understand we're never going to be the original 12. We don't have their authority. I understand that. But have you ever noticed, that, can, I, can I bring something up here? Would you get your concordance out and look for the word missionary in your Bible? You look it up. It ain't in there. Why? Because apostle is a missionary. It's one sent out by the Lord to another country. So whenever we send someone out, they are our apostles to that area. That's the only word in the New Testament re reflects that. So do we need missionaries? Of course. And why are they first? Because when you go into a country, that's the first one that goes. So no, we'll, no, we don't have the original 12. No, we don't have all their abilities. But we still can have people we send out. That's what the word apostle means. Sent out of the Lord. And we need to do that into far countries. And that needs to be one of the ways we do ministry. And you need to volunteer. Some of you need to do mission work. So you need to be the apostle there. Some of you should do it all the time. Maybe just leave this country and go. It would be a wonderful thing for you to do. And let us become prophets. Now, prophets are just spirit-filled preachers 
convincing and convicting others so that they would convert and do what the scriptures already said. That's all that the prophets primarily did. Oh yeah, I know that there were prophets that did foretell the future, did do all that. But you've got to understand, the bulk of them didn't do that. In Elijah's day, Elijah did not even write. There's no scripture he wrote. And the 50 or the 100 uh, prophets that he saved, not a single one of them ever made a prophecy that we have a record of in the sense of foretelling the future. The majority of those prophets prophesied by reading the scriptures and telling the people to do what the scripture said. That's what we call preachers even today. And so we need more of them, and they do convict. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14, 24, it convicts and converts people so that they fall down on their knees and say, God is in you of a truth. But then let us become evangelists. Now what's in the difference between evangelists and a prophet? According to the scriptures, not according to definitions you'll see in books, but according to the scriptures, it's someone who preaches Christ in many cities. That's Philip, that's Timothy. They are called evangelists because they preach here, then they preach here, and then they preach here. He said, well, what's the difference of that and a missionary? It's not a lot of difference. It's just you're preaching there. Not everybody that goes out on mission works preaches at the various locations. But the ones who preach there, and then they preach in that city, and they preach in that city, and they preach in that city, they're called evangelists. So you can be a preacher, you can be an evangelist, that overlaps again. But we need people who are willing to go to various cities to do it. And let us be pastors. Now, pastor, you may think that I'm the pastor of this congregation, but I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm like a prophet here. You might call me an evangelist, but the truth is that the pastor, the word, literally means the idea of a shepherd and a bishop and an overseer of a local congregation. We have eight of those in this congregation. Now we have other men who are like them or maybe even retired from that. We've got several of those. But we've got like eight guys who are the ones who are to oversee this flock to make sure that we're fed. Talked about in Acts 20 and 28, they were made overseers by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Timothy 5 verse 17, some of them preach the word and that's great. Some of them teach and preach. Not every one of them would be expected to teach and preach, otherwise it wouldn't be that kind of statement. But let's be pastors. Some of you young men need to set at your goal to be a, a pastor, an elder, a bishop of congregations. You need to do that. Just make that your goal to get married, to have a family, and be able to do that one day. And let's become teachers. Who can't do that? Well, let me tell you who can't do that. Someone who's immature and not spirit-filled. But if you're mature and a spirit-filled Christian, then I believe God's working in you to help you develop and teach. But if for after years you're not doing that, you're gotten known to in the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. There ought to be a developmental process. We are supposed to grow up and get to the point that we could actually teach someone how to become a Christian, how to obey the gospel, how to live the Christian life. Yes, of course we should. And do that in a class setting? Well, yeah, or not. You can do it in a public, you can do it privately. But you should be able to do that after a certain period of time. And we need that. That's a part of our game plan. All five of those are essential. That's how we do this work. But with all of that, folks, these five ministry deeds are our church's game plan. But it takes another thing, and that is we've got to understand it's all for us. You've got to have a passion for us, not just you. It's not if we don't pat you on the back because you taught a Bible class and nobody says thank you, you've got to understand we're sorry, but the truth is we wanted to pat you on the back. We just forgot to do it because we weren't thinking about us. But if you get mad, you've just forgot you're not thinking about us either. So we got to do it all for us, right? And we got to work toward patting other people on the back, but we got to do it all for us. There's got to be a passion there. We do it for each other. We do it for us. Those on our side, the saved, those being saved, those who will be saved, we do it all for us. In Mark chapter 9, it says, He who is not against us is on our side. Romans 8, 32, If God is for us, who can be against us? There is an us. And the us matters. It really does matter. That's a blurry picture. I'm sorry, that's the best I could do. Guy's name is uh, Les Brown. Sheriff deputy from, looks like 1955, 1982 in San Diego. This is a true story. I'll end on this story. It's not a make-believe story. It's in a museum. 
This is the story. Les Brown, uh, as a deputy, he was back in the early 70s. He was taking somebody else's uh, route, whatever they call them, I don't know what they call them, their dispatch, their car for the day. That guy was sick or something, and so he stepped in to do their part. He'd been on the force for a while. And suddenly, so he doesn't know the area of town he's in. He's unaware. He just doesn't know this district really that well. So in San Diego there, he suddenly gets this dispatch, code blue, code three, something like that. I don't know these codes, but I think it's code three. And he said, child choking. So he knows he's only got minutes. So he, in his mind, he tries to work out the best he can how to get to that location where he's going. So he jumps on, he knows that the main roads were blocked at that time of the day. So he knows that there was a new highway going through that they'd just about finished. He thought, well, I can get on that, bypass everything. I'm a police officer, I can get up on it, and I can go. So he got up on the highway that wasn't finished. And so he goes by the first exit, that's not it. Second exit, no, that's not it. He gets to the exit that he knows is it. Problem is, so when he gets there, he's on a mountain virtually. This is San Diego. He's like on a mountain, and they haven't built the road. So it's right down there, but he can't get down there. He's got minutes. You know, it's clicking away. There's a child choking. I got to get there. I got to get there. And as he gets out of his car, stands there, looks down over the rail, down the hillside, and about that time, a giant earth mover pulls up beside him. He says to him, you got a problem? And he looks up at him and he says, I got a child down here I got to get to that's choking, but there's no road here. Fellow says, follow me. There'll be one in a minute. And he's a giant earth mover and he just pulls in front of him, stay right behind me, and he goes down. Now, down at the bottom of the hill is this giant ditch. So he follows him all the way down over this bumpy thing he's creating. They get all the way to the bottom. When he gets down to the bottom, he grabs dirt. He fills this ditch and he drives across it, gets out, and here he tears his car to pieces. But he gets through this and he gets out. He gets to the house, goes in the house. The woman's standing in the yard holding the baby like this, and it's, the baby's turned blue. And she says, and she's screaming, and the baby's making no noise. He grabs the baby, does something like a Heimlich thing, and out pops a button. Apparently because there were holes in the button, the baby hadn't died, even though it had been a long time. And in a few minutes, the baby perked up, was fine. So the officer saved a life that day. and he, He's so busy that he, he goes on to the hospital with him, all that stuff, and so he didn't get back and talk to the construction worker. So like three days later, he drives up to that place again to talk to the construction worker. He gets out of his vehicle, he looks out across, he sees the construction worker running that machine, and he sees down there the construction worker looks up and sees the deputy. He jumps off of his piece of equipment, starts running toward the deputy. And the deputy just wants to thank him. He says, and he, the man's saying, the baby, the baby, the baby. He says, yeah, man, we were really a team the other day. We really pulled that off. The baby, the baby. Yeah, man, it was great. Thank you for your help. The baby, the baby. And you notice that he's, it's almost like a frantic sound. When he gets to him, he says, yeah, wasn't that great what we did? And he's out of breath. And he says, the baby was my son. What we do, we do don't do for me. We do for us. We are on the same team, my friend. We must have a passion for us because it is your baby. It is your baby we're worried about. And unless you bring that kind of passion to the game, it doesn't matter how good a plan we've got, we'll fail. But if we bring the passion for one another, we'll succeed. If you're here today and you've learned what you need to do, we'll help you fulfill that. Whatever your need, we'll work with you 
But don't come for just you. Yes, come for you. But come knowing you come for us. God bless you. Come if you will. Why don't we stand alone?